So you guys, are you ready? Okay. It's been a crazy week for me. Uh, as you know, I'm a pastor, so I pray. And, uh, and I have this list. I don't carry this list with me. This is our directory. Uh, Ken Woods has lovingly collected our directory, and I have all these people in an app on my phone so that I go on these walks around my block. And uh, when I first started, the directory was a little bit smaller because it didn't have kids on it, and, and like the kids were sort of lumped in with parents. So I've, we've separated it all out. So now my walks that were like an hour are like two and a half hour walks, or there are times at night when I'm just sitting in bed on my phone just scrolling through. My wife's sleeping, I'm praying. And, uh, and one of the things that I love about being a pastor is that I get to pray for you. And I know that, that so often you think, well, I want to go to church to, to hear what God would say, to hear what the pastor would have to say. But I hope, I hope that somewhere in your heart you realize that um, what I say from here, it, it can be helpful. It can connect you to Jesus. The good news can penetrate your heart. But I believe that more important than that, I go before God and I cling to God and I beg God on your behalf. And that's what I was doing this week as I was going to wrap up my sermon preparation as we're going through the book of Acts. And God said, stop. I said, stop, Ryan. No more Acts. Pause button on Acts. Because we just went through this story where Saul encounters Jesus. Where Saul gets, gets shrouded in darkness. Where Saul gets healed. And then where Saul at the end of it says he received the Holy Spirit. And then all that I could hear in my mind that day was, it's time to preach about my spirit, Ryan. It's time to preach about my spirit. Now, I am a conservative-leaning, conservative theology guy, so the Holy Spirit can uh, terrify me. Like, if I'm being told that, it's a mystery because the Holy Spirit is God's spirit, unfathomable, not understandable, and God said, preach about the Holy Spirit. So I do what every like old theologian nerd would do. Let's just go read about him. And as I'm reading about the Holy Spirit, God says, no, not just information. Tell them who I am. So there, here we are today. And, um, and for those of you who are wondering, I, I know there's some, some charismatics, some assemblies of God, some Pentecostals, and you're like, yeah, man, he's going to start slaying people in the Spirit. I don't think so, because I don't know how to do that. Uh, Jared texted me this morning, because we met as a staff, and so they, the staff knew where I was going, and Jared said, I had a dream last night that you were going to speak in tongues on stage. <laughs> I didn't text him back, but I'm going to text him and say, Jared, I used my tongue to speak on stage. But that's as far as I know that I'll go, but I don't want to put God in any box because I'm tired of God being in a box. Uh, and it wouldn't be fitting if we were going to talk about the Spirit and did not ask him uh, to, to show up this morning. So let's pray, and we're going to get into his word. God, I, um, I have a lot of facts in my head about you, but those those mean so little compared to knowing you and how much you love us. God, take away any scent of fear of men that I have in my heart so that I would preach boldly who you are and who you call us to be. God, I pray that your spirit would fill people here, that they would encounter you, that they would encounter beyond the information, that they would encounter life-transforming power. God, I'm sick of just playing church. Show us what it means to be the empowered people. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be jumping around. I apologize if the scriptures aren't all back there, because when I set that up, um, I, I had done more studying and more preparation all week. So some will be back there. Some you'll just have to listen. We're going to be in John chapter 14, in John chapter 16, in Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 2, in Romans chapter 8, if you want to flip to all those paces. I'd recommend that um, you read John chapter 14 and 16 this week, if you have the time. I mean, you have the time. Read the whole book of John this week. You got the time. Read the whole Bible this week. I, just do something. Okay, John 14. Jesus had just told his disciples that he was going to die, that he was going to go away. And the disciples were distraught. 
it would be distressing for any of us to be losing our best friend. The disciples loved Jesus. I'm talking mega, madly in love with Jesus. And, and we've, we've got to start there. Most of us here would say we know what love is, right? If I, let's just ask a question. Who knows they think like some semblance of what love is and or feels like? Anyone experience a taste of that? If you're married, you better raise your hand, especially if you're the husband. You better be like, I know, I got the love down. Now, I love love. God is love. There's this intense emotional and social and, and intellectual connection that happens. And we've all seen love, right? We've seen the, the engagement love. That's one of my favorites. The engagement love is so cool. Because when a girl gets engaged, that day, she can't hear anything else. That day, the guy could be the biggest, most insanely knuckle-headed guy on the planet, and she's like, I just love you. Because she's not looking at him. Where is she looking the whole day? Her ring, right? Like, she's obsessed. I love that. I wish I could just propose to my wife once a week so she just walks around like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that love. And then you go from that love to newlywed love. Newlywed love is so adorable if you're in it and so sickening when you're past it. Because newlywed love, it's like they have this intense passion for each other and they get married and they're all googly-eyed and the husband will use the, the bath towel to clean up oil and the wife's like, that's okay, I love you for month one. And all of these things happen. You load the dishwasher different. It's okay, it's just so cute for year one. And then we get a different kind of love. We get the lasting love. But before that, between, between newlywed love and the lasting love, which I've had the privilege of, of standing alongside of couples who have been together for decades as a husband or a wife holds a hand of their loved one passing, and you see in their eyes an ocean of memories, an ocean of joy that they've shared with that person. Between there, there's this uh, love that I think might be the second most powerful love that we'll talk about, which is the mother's love. I love mother's love. I mean, think about how crazy supernatural this is. An alien invades a woman's body. For nine months is trying to kill her by stealing her food, her nutrients, by adding size and girth, which all women love, by making them so uncomfortable they're stuffing pillows in every crevice so that they can get one hour sleep so that they can wake up and berate their husbands for stealing a pillow in the middle of the night just because he had none left. Hypothetically, this has happened to somebody I know. And then all of a sudden, after nine months of torture and torment, the baby fights its way out of the mother with a violent expulsion. And they lay the baby on the mother, and this mother actually loves this hostile being who's been trying to kill her for nine months. I mean, this is mega love. And not only that, the baby then goes on to test the patience of both mother and father by keeping them awake for hours on end. And the parents, all you kids, that's us, we don't kill you. That is mega love. All the new parents in here are like, I might kill my baby today, I don't know. But there's one greater love. Of course, it's the love of Christ that he laid down his life for us. But he didn't just want to do it for us as this external act. That wasn't the last step. Right here, we have Jesus saying, I love you, I'm leaving you, I'm going to die. I'm your best friend and I'm gone. It's gonna be over soon. And the disciples are freaking out. And here's what Jesus says to them. Let not your hearts be troubled. Sorry, this isn't gonna be on the screen. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. Where I am, you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. So right now, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. Disciples, don't be afraid. I'm leaving, don't be afraid. And they're like, Jesus, you've been with us. We should be afraid. What happens if we're in a boat and another storm comes and you're not there? What happens when a leper comes and you're not there? What happens if a demon-possessed person comes and you're not there? What happens if somebody asks us some tough Bible question and you're not there? He says, don't worry. Let not your hearts be troubled. Anyone here have troubled hearts lately? Have heavy hearts lately? 
well, this is going to be a good news sermon for you because here's where Jesus goes. He's telling them he's leaving, and now he's going to jump in and give them the greatest gift that you could possibly have. Verse 15 of John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is why we don't have to be afraid. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in you. And I know what's happening right now. Um, church people, we have our armor on, and we have our knowledge. And so we're thinking, Holy Spirit of God in me, yeah. Ah, Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit who right now is sustaining life around the entire globe. Every breath that you're taking is being sustained by the power of his presence. Every bird on every branch is being monitored by his sovereign power. Every hair on your head he knows down to the number. Every star in the universe, not galaxy, in the universe, he is present and aware of and governing and ordaining and hovering through in and about Every moment that this world is spinning around on its axis, hurling around the sun, as the sun is moving around the galaxy, as the galaxy is catapulting through the universe, the spirit is powerfully propelling, compelling, creating, governing all of that. And that spirit lives in you if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And so often, we put him in the back and say, yes, I have the Holy Spirit. How do you know? Well, I, I received Jesus, so I have him, right? Well, Acts 1, verse 8, it's been in the theme uh, video for this whole Acts series, says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Everyone say power. And you will be my witnesses. Everyone say witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, to the end of the earth. If you want to know you have, if you have the Holy Spirit, you will have power. Not piddly, podunk power. Not weak power, but the power of the God of the universe who creates something from nothing, who speaks matter into existence with the power of his word, and his spirit can hover to any place at any time. And you will be my witnesses. When people talk about the Holy Spirit, they get caught up. They get thinking about all the gifts of the Spirit, which are good, but they sometimes lose sight of the person of the Holy Spirit. There are uh, brothers and sisters in Christianity, and, and I'm all over the board on this. So if you want to know where I am, you can ask me later. But there's charismatics. Those are people who speak in something called tongues, which is an unknown language or languages that are unknown to themselves. And, and I, I don't know how to do that all the time. I wish that I did, because I read in the Bible, desire the gifts of the Spirit. But some denominations get caught up on that. And then there's other denominations that say, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't work in that way. The Holy Spirit just comes in and seals you. He, he's like Tupperware packages you up so you don't go to hell when you die. And there's no gifts necessarily anymore because we've moved past that. I don't believe in that. I, I try to stick to what the Bible says about the Spirit, but more than that, I think we grieve the heart of God when the Holy Spirit becomes all about us and not all about Him. When we're saying, what can we get from the Holy Spirit? What can he give me rather than what can I do for him? And how can I be in trail of him? When he comes, the only thing that we have in the Bible for sure, it's not tongues, it's not prophecy, it's not amazing understanding. The only thing for sure that the Bible says every believer will get is power and you will be a witness. You will have the power of God in you. And that power will be somehow linked to the way you share the good news about Jesus with others. And here's the coolest part of it all. When he comes, he will dwell in you. In you. In you. I'm going to flip ahead. I want us to think about this. In John 16, here's what Jesus says. Uh, John 16, verses... Uh, Man, why can't I ever find these things? It's because I highlight here and there. John 16, it says in verse 8, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Here's what I love about this. The Spirit is going to dwell in us and he is going to convict us. Anybody here felt like they've been on the business end of some other Christian judging them harshly? I've been on the business end of that a lot. Of someone trying to convict me. Sometimes, um, especially when I'm doing marriage series, uh, ser sermon series, I see wives trying to be the Holy Spirit to their husbands and husbands trying to do it to their wives. Because I'll say something like, hey, a guy shouldn't do this. And here's how the wife tries to be the Holy Spirit. Eh, eh, eh. Or sometimes, and maybe this is just me, not you, because I sin really bad. I'll be listening to a sermon and I'll think this thought. Oh, you know who needs to hear this sermon? And if you ever have that thought come into your head, just say, comma, myself. Because we're so prone to point. We're so prone to try to be the Holy Spirit. We're so prone to try to, to govern the world with morality, not realizing that, that Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will come and convict. The Holy Spirit is the one that when he arrives here, he's going to convict the world. We don't have to convict the world. We preach the good news, and we say, Spirit, convict. Now, sometimes as a pastor, people ask me, how do I deal with this person? My, my neighbor's sinning, my family member's sinning. What do I say? What do I do? And I'll tell them, just pray. Just pray that God's Spirit will be around and in their lives and let Him do the convicting. Well, that'll take too long. Well, if you think that your timing is better than God's timing, by all means, go for it. But so often we want to do that. So often we, we can't wait for the Spirit to do His job, so we try, I try, to do the Spirit's job for him. But we cannot do this. We cannot do this. The Holy Spirit must be the power to convict of sin, to convict people that judgment is coming, to convict people that righteousness had arrived. And here's how he does it, by being in you. And before I read the next verse, anyone here think it'd be cool to have Jesus with you? Like with you, next to you right now. Anyone want that ever? I want that all the time. I mean, literally, I obsess about Jesus being next to me all the time. Sometimes when I disciple people, I'll have them walk around blocks, and when they do it, I'll say, hey, when you're walking around the block on the sidewalk, I want you to stand to one side and pray out loud like Jesus is right there. And they'll, they'll say, well, people will think I'm crazy. It's okay, you kind of are if you're listening to me. So they're walking around the block, and they'll come around, are you praying like Jesus right there? Yeah, does it feel like it? Eh, kind of, I don't know, sort of weird. I think it'd be the best, you guys, seriously. Could you imagine if Jesus were next to me right now, how easy it would be to share the good news, to witness about him anywhere I went. I could go to a coffee shop, any coffee shop I wanted to, go to Oxford Exchange, go downtown, go wherever I want, and, and instead of being all fearful, like, okay, what am I going to say about Jesus? i got to work up this answer. Jesus is right here. He's like sitting with me like, yeah, yeah, are you going to do this? Are you going to do this? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, Jesus, I got this. And then I would get to the moment, and someone would say, tell me about this Savior. And I'd be like, here he is, Done. <laughs> Done. Just tell him, Jesus, tell, tell him the things you told me. Do that thing with the water and the wine. It's awesome. Or could you imagine trying to sin? Like there's so many sins that plague us, so many sins that hold us down. And, and we know, like, I want to be freed from this. I want to just be released from the bondage of this, from the shackles. Imagine trying to sin when Jesus is just sitting right there next to you. You're sitting there. You're looking on Facebook. You see somebody's post start making fun of him in your head, he's like, I know what you're thinking. <gasps> He'd be right there. Now, I want you to think about all that, that means. Oh, not only that, you ever get sick? Imagine being sick with Jesus. Get a flu. Jesus, could you do me a solid? Yes, my son. Whew. Get cancer, terrified to death. Jesus, could you reach in and just, I got you. Boop, boop, boop. It would be pretty cool to have Jesus next to you. But here's what Jesus says. From the mouth of Jesus himself, 16, verse 7, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Look at that word advantage. Advantage. How in the world is it to our advantage that the Son of God, Jesus incarnate, goes away. I really want him here with me. If I had Jesus next to me, 
my job would be so easy, you guys. I would get up on Sunday, and I'd say, hello, my name is Ryan, and I'm your pastor. Here's Jesus. And I'd walk right there. But instead, Jesus says, it's to your advantage, Ryan. It's to your advantage, disciples. It's to your advantage that I go away because I'm going to send someone who's going to dwell in you. Now, there's a huge difference between something being next to you and something being inside of you. There is a huge amount of difference between knowing about something that you can examine and experiencing something for yourself. Some of you know this. Some of you have lived a lot of life. Some of you know that there is a difference between reading about cancer and getting cancer. Some of you know there's a difference between knowing about death and having a loved one die. Some of you know the difference between simply knowing that, that tragedy happens, that car accidents happen, that children uh, that, that can pass away, that miscarriages happen. Some of you know about those things. Some of you have lived through those things. And for those of you who have lived through those things, you know, you know as well as I know that it is radically different than when you just know about it. This is the Holy Spirit, a person who wants you to experience him person who wants to dwell in you, make his home in you, and sometimes we treat him like a gift machine to just dispense another gift to us so that we can do what we want. In all of my study in the Holy Spirit this week, and we're going to go through the coming weeks diving in deeper, the one conviction that stood out was that I've treated the Spirit, and maybe the biggest sin in my entire Christian life, I've treated the Spirit like a set of ideas and not like a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible refers to him as a he. And then he can be grieved. And that he can be worshipped. The Holy Spirit is a he who can be sinned against. And I think I have sinned against the Spirit by treating him like an idea. The reality is he's so more wild and out of control than I would want him to be. And I think that's why I've tried to box him up. The Bible refers to the Spirit as the wind. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is ruach. In the New Testament, the word is pneuma. And it's the same words for wind and breath. My son recently told somebody at his school about God. I give him a mission every day. Hey, buddy, tell someone about God. Ask them if they know who God is. And he told his friend, Bobby. And Jackson comes home crying. I'm like, Jackson, why are you crying? I told Bobby, and he doesn't believe in God. And then I didn't know what to say next. And I said, son, the Holy Spirit will convict him of his little sin. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I said, Jackson, it's not your job to convince him. It's your job to share the good news. But what do I do, God? I, Dad, I didn't have the words. I didn't know what to say. I said, Jackson. You pray, and you say, God, I need your power to know what to say next. So he gears up for school the next day. He's pumped. He's going to tell Bobby the gospel. And I also told him to ask his teacher uh, if she believed in God as well. And he comes back to school. He's like, Jackson, did you carry out the mission? No, Dad, I failed. <laughs> okay. You're not my son. No, I didn't say that. I said, it's okay, buddy. Sometimes it is scary. And he said, Daddy, what if they don't like me? I said, buddy, they might not like you. But here's a promise that I have for you. The Spirit of God will give you power to witness. And here's what he said, and here's what a lot of us think in our minds, whether we say it out loud or not. Daddy, how do I know God exists? And this is where I get outside of that box of Christianity. Because I can't use all of the arguments anymore. I can't say, well, here's the cosmological argument for the existence of God, and here's the teleological argument. Here's this, Jackson. Let me book, break out this book. Here's the chart diagram. Boom, boom, boom. I say, Jackson, it's like the wind. It's like my breath. You can't see it, but you know that it's there because you can see what it's doing, and you blow on its face. Did you feel that? Yeah. Did you see it? No. Did you smell it? Maybe. Jackson, look at the bamboo in our backyard. Is it moving? Yeah, yeah. How is it moving? The wind, Daddy. Do you see the wind? No. Do you see what it's doing? Yeah. The power of the Holy Spirit in your life, whether or not you believe in God, whether or not you have those questions, I, I'm not trying to answer all of those today, but what I want you to know 
is that the Spirit is named, I think aptly so, breath and wind, because we cannot control it any longer. We've got to stop trying to corral him. We've got to stop saying that this is what we do and anything outside of this we don't do. Because I think when I look around, not this church, but the capital C church in this nation, I'm grieved and scared that we've taken the Spirit and we've put him in a little jar and we've said, okay, you're here to give us your seal of approval, but now, God, we're going to do membership classes and baptism classes and we're going to lead people to Jesus. We're going to do all these good things, but Spirit, you just stay here in this jar because we don't want you unleashed because when wind gets unleashed, it does damage and we can't control it. We got to control you. I sometimes wonder how many times I've done this myself. Like baptism. I've been at big churches and small churches. We do baptism classes. I read the Bible and here's how I see their baptism class went. You repented. You turned from your sin. You believed. That's great. You believe in Jesus. That's great. Let's baptize you right now after a six-week class on what it means to be baptized, submerged, sprinkled, dunked, or whatever. In the Bible, they just went, you repented? You turned from, from being your own God to saying, I'm going to follow a God instead of make God follow me? You've turned and you believe in Jesus? Let's baptize you right now. I like that kind of stuff. And I know as Americans, we're terrified. Because what if I said, someone fill up the baptismal right now. Anyone that repents and believes today, we're baptizing them. We'd be like, well, do we do that? I didn't bring a change of clothes. I'm wearing what? I don't know. What do I do? We, we let the spirit out of the jar and let him do what he's going to do. Some of us, I think, me, I've tried to make church about all the measurables. Because I can measure I can measure a lot of things. I can count statistics. I can get charts and graphs. I am excited about that. The Holy Spirit of God, I think he's into numbers, charts, and graphs. But more than that, I think he wants us to know that he is making his home within us and giving us his power to be his witnesses, to know that the God of the universe is walking alongside us every moment of every day, and we have nothing to fear. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples here. You're afraid that I'm going? I'm sending you someone who's going to live in you. It's not me next to you. It's now it's going to be me living, dwelling, changing you from the core out, inhabiting your soul, changing your thoughts, changing your heart, so that all of your life will be consumed with me. The Holy Spirit is obsessed with Jesus. Obsessed. Obsessed more than, than a bride is with her husband on a wedding day, more than a husband is with his bride on a wedding day. Obsessed with Jesus more than a, a new set of parents are obsessed with that little baby. The Holy Spirit is obsessed with Jesus more than Rex is obsessed with candy. That's a lot, you guys. That's more than mothers and children. So guess who you think you should be obsessed with or would be obsessed with, rather, if the Holy Spirit's in you? Starts with a J, rhymes with ease us. I think we forget that sometimes. I think we want to make the Holy Spirit neat and nice and say, well, I said a prayer once, so that means he's in me, right? I don't know that that's the case. I think when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will know because the power of God will be in you. You'll start to hate things you once loved and love things you once never thought about, cared about, or despised. You'll start to lose fear of what others think about you because you know that Jesus thinks the world of you and that you're his. You'll start to realize that God's home is not in some far-off distant place, but in the core of your being, and that he loves you so much he chooses to take up residence there. You'll love him so much that you'll be compelled to tidy up that home by his power, because you know it's been a train wreck inside there, and you've wanted things and thought things that would make anyone shudder. And now you know God has taken up dwelling inside of you. This is the Holy Spirit that we need to unleash in our lives. That we would experience him and not just know more about him. That he would transform us and not just inform us. That we would let him do his job of convicting the world and stick to our job of being bearers of good news and light about Jesus Christ. If you do not have the Holy Spirit today, or if you're unsure, I would ask you that question. If we were able to have a cup of coffee, I'd say, are you madly in love with Jesus? 
Can you just not get them off of your mind? Because church, when I pray through this list, it's a, uh, you're not all on this list, by the way, because there's some of you I pray for that I know aren't on here. But I go through and I pray for Edwin and Kathy. I go through and I, I pray. I pray for, for David and I pray for Valerie. I pray for Tiffany Casto. I pray for the Casto family because they fix everything that breaks at my house. I pray for, for Melvin and, and the entire Colvin clan. They've got like a whole clan of people. They just make babies. Um, I pray for all the people making babies. Like, there's so many pregnant women here. You guys need to stop it because I don't want to get pregnant with my wife. I pray for the Diggins, whose son just went off to college. And, and you know, that's crazy adjustment for a mother to do that. I, I pray for, um, I, I call them the sports clan because I can't pronounce their last name. But they greet you almost every week. They've got like a million kids, and they're at that door or that door. The, the, I don't know how you say your last name. How do you say your last name? Zekin? Yeah. Man, even though he's a Packers fan, I pray for him. You want to know what I pray for every one of you as I go through this list? Pray, God, fill them with your spirit. Make them madly in love with Jesus. God, fill them with your spirit. Make them madly in love with Jesus. Because when that happens, as I'm going down this list, if you're filled with God's spirit, you're getting the comforter who can comfort you no matter what you're going through. You're getting the peacemaker who can give you peace no matter how unrestful and stressful your life is. You're getting the very presence of God who can take cancer cells apart from healthy cells. You're getting the presence of God who can take depression and literally take it and put it outside of your brain. You're getting the presence of God who can make it so you once loved this thing and once had this addiction and said, no more, I'm giving you this love for Jesus and I'm freeing you from that addiction. That's why I go through this list and pray for you. That's why I come up here and I want to tell you that this Holy Spirit, we've got to let him out of this jar because I can't contain him. He is the wind. He's not like a hurricane that just bends the tree. He is 10,000 hurricanes that changes souls from dead to alive. And that's, and that's who can be in you. And, and I guess all that to say, as we intro the Holy Spirit, this person, we're going to explore more about him and then how he comes into us in the following probably seven to eight weeks. I just need you to know that um, you're probably going to see your pastor cry more. My wife came into my office a couple times this week and said, why are you crying? Because I had this list in front of me on my phone. Because I had my own sins in front of me. And the Holy Spirit is slowly trying to rip that jar open that I'm trying to close shut because it scares this middle-aged conservative white guy. And I'm just tired of playing that game. So here's what I'm going to do for 30 seconds. I'm going to give you an opportunity just to pray. You pray in your head. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you areas of your life when you've been trying to keep him in the jar and not letting him loose to consume your life with a passionate love for Jesus. So go ahead and take that moment. Our tech team will play some music. And we'll also close this out. so many of us need help in our families, so many of us need help in our marriages, so many people here need help with raising their kids and help with knowing how to wrestle and deal with the doubts and the fears and the stress. God, remind me every day that I am not the chapel 
helper. That you are our helper. That you are our comforter. And that you being in us is better. It's to our advantage. It's greater than Jesus being beside us. Do I believe that? Do we believe that? Father, I pray that this week the sounds of rushing winds would flood into our lives. That your breath would break through our hard hearts. That I would stop trying to play God. That I would stop trying to put you in a box. And that as we explore who you are, we would know at the end of this series why it's to our advantage. That Jesus went to your right hand and that you would send your spirit to make his home within us. God, I love you. Be the God of the chapel. Lead people to your Son and make us witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen.